everybody. Welcome to Men Having Babies webinar on uh, community after birth. We're so glad you guys have joined us today. My name is Lisa Schuster. I'm the programming director here at Men Having Babies. If you are a member um, of our organization, you probably have seen me at many of our um, workshops and drop-in groups. Uh, if you're not a member, I hope you join and then you'll get to see a lot more of us here. Um, but we really are focused so much at Men Having Babies on the parenting journey and getting you guys um, to, to being parents. A lot of our educational resources, um, as well as our, our additional resources for our members and GPAP recipients is really focused on that part of your journey. Um, but that's really just the, the start of a lifelong journey of parenting. Um, and as we know, and Ron will talk a little bit more in detail later, um, so many of our guides, once they become parents, have uh, a real big interest in learning more about programs, having a bigger support system. Um, and so that's why we're here today to kind of talk to some of our partners we've worked with in conjunction with our conferences, but have amazing programming outside of that. Um, and they're going to share some of their experiences. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Ron Paul Diane, who is executive director and founder of Men Having Babies, to share some of his um, personal experience and, and what he's learned along the way. Thank you, Lisa. And, and really, um, the distinction between prospective parents and uh, parents uh, sometimes is, is not that clear cut, given that we know that uh, I think it's between 30 and 40 percent of the people who uh, uh, have you know, participated in our parenting survey uh, indicated that they are still um, expecting to have another child through surrogacy uh, later on in their lives. Having said that, when your kids are out of home and in college, uh, uh, that that's probably when <laughs> you know that line is getting getting a little clear. So I'm obviously on that part of the uh, that side of the line. Uh, my husband and I uh, have kids who are uh, almost 21 years old. So looking back at um, at uh, our you know experience, and of course we're talking about experience that spans decades that uh, have been quite different than you know uh, our present uh, reality. Um, you know, we've obviously really, really needed uh, more support uh, to become parents, which is why we started Men Having Babies. But once they, our kids were born, we really benefited from uh, terrific services we had at the LGBT Center, uh, which was called Center Kids and then Center Families. Some of the services don't exist anymore, but, uh, you know, maybe, you know, they'll come back at some, at some point. But they consisted of opportunities to uh, get together with other parents. Now, when we were, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, able to go to a play date or to a Halloween party or something like this for LGBT parents, many times uh, our kids uh, or many of the other kids were kids of female couples. Uh, so our kids didn't necessarily always get the sense of we're not the only kids in the world that have two dads. Uh, and uh, in fact, it looked like a, you know, pretty standard uh, setting for them, not very different than their schools. Um, later, later, we had opportunities, that there were picnics uh, and other events uh, organized just for uh, gay parents, for, for male gay parents, which uh, were perhaps uh, helping to uh, achieve another goal uh, in the eyes of the kids. Uh, of course, we, uh, you know, had other opportunities such as um, uh, summer vacations, either through our family, um, um, our family vacations, uh, the, you know, what was called Rosie's Cruises. Uh, once again, both gays and lesbians and, um, and other people were there. Uh, our kids were also able, years later, to go to uh, summer camps, actually a, a terrific camp. Uh, um, in Pennsylvania, which is one of several camps uh, around the country, at least in the United States. So we have a perspective of, of seeing what um, benefit our kids uh, had from uh, the ability to be in spaces. And, and later in their lives, they, they got it that some of the kids are kids of lesbians and, uh, and, and uh, some are adopted, some surrogacy, you know, all kinds of uh, families. And, and they, you know, once they go beyond, I don't know, eight, or nine years old, uh, they don't have to see just male parents to understand that this is an LGBT uh, event. But when they were small, you know, it wasn't always that easy to explain to them what we're doing. At the same time, we also had needs and uh, we needed, you know, to be able to understand more about, you know, what or, or, or network about what other people are, you know, 
uh, are doing to deal with their schools and other uh, circumstances um, where we, um, you know, face specific um, challenges as, as parents of uh, or, or same-sex parents. So the intent today is to talk about the fact that we we see ourselves, Men Living Babies, as a specialized uh, organization, um, uh, one in, that can add um, that specialty to other LGBT organizations that are more local and community-based. So as such, we you know, are unable to have events in many cities. We are unable to have continuing events to the extent that we would otherwise want. And we would like to find ways to better partner with organizations that are able to provide the full life cycle of events uh, by either just bringing them forward and uh, making sure that you're aware of their services, but also by communicating and interacting about what we know are some of the needs of the specific population uh, that we know better, which are uh, biological you know, uh, dads through surrogacy. So um, should I go through that uh, needs assessment now, Lisa, or should we first do the, the, a roundup of introductions? Let's do, let's do a round of introductions. And I also want to add, um, if you have questions that pop into your head as we go along, please feel free to use that Q&A tab um, and we'll, I'll monitor them as they come in and, and we'll address them. So um, don't hesitate to ask questions if you have it, but um, if we wanna start off by, um, I'll let Jolie start off and uh, introduce yourself and, and a bit more about Center on Halstead. Thanks, Lisa, I appreciate that. And thanks, uh, Ron and everyone. I'm Jolie Holloman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Senior Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Community Programs at Centrone Halstead in Chicago. Uh, we are the Midwest's largest LGBTQ center and our focus is about, uh, our mission is to improve and advance the well-being of and health of LGBTQ communities. So we have been around for almost 20 years now and we are located in Lakeview up north. And although our reach expands, and especially many of you I'm sure can relate during this time of COVID, uh, it's, it's allowed us to really um, give access to a lot of the geographic areas that we'd wanted to previously. Um, and now we can share a lot of our services and a lot of our knowledge, uh, especially for our families who may not have been able to come all the way to Lakeview. Now we have things that we can offer virtually. So um, I, I don't want to, I could talk a lot about all the services that <laughs> center on Halstead because we offer everything from uh, HIV screening to behavioral health. Uh, but again, the focus here today is on our family programming and our family programming is dynamic. Um, it offers the play dates uh, that Ron kind of spoke about, but it offers that community piece. Um, it really is a place where we like to build networking opportunities for parents, but also build up uh, the confidence and the language for children. So uh, what else can I share? Sorry. I think, I mean, I think that was perfect, a perfect intro to what you guys do. Um, and really touching on the point that it, it really takes a village. As you go through surrogacy, you know that you have a whole team um, helping you to become parents. Um, but that doesn't end when you become parents. It's so important to, to have that, uh, that community of support that it does. It is absolutely true that it takes a village. Um, so I'm gonna let Sarah introduce uh, herself and talk a little bit more about your programming. Yes, hi, I'm Sarah Koster. I'm from the Netherlands. So apologies for my maybe not too good English. Um, uh, Meer dan gewenst is the Dutch foundation for, yeah, we say pink parenting, LGBT parenting. Um, we are a volunteer organization, so we uh, can do a lot. We want to do a lot, but we can't do everything we want. Uh, we focus a lot on intended uh, parents, but also uh, the community is getting, of course, larger and larger. There are more and more people who have children. Um, so we organize something called Meet the Pink Parents, and then it's an evening where you can have a drink and have a chat, and it's intended parents together with parents. So parents can meet each other, but also intended parents can talk to experienced parents. 
Um, and sometimes we do that in combination with the speed date where intended parents can really meet each other at, at the speed date. But if there are not enough people to speed date, we combine it with meet the pink parents. Um, and we see that intended parents love to speak to the experienced parents and also with each other and also the experienced parents love to be in touch with other parents. But also we organize things with the children during the day. But I'm from the Netherlands, so in the winter it's difficult to have a picnic. <laughs> it's always raining. Um, so we do it maybe twice a year and we try to do it in each region, but we're depending on volunteers. So I think we have twice a year we have something. And what we see is that mostly parents of younger children come because older children, they're not interested in, yeah, I have two mothers or I have two fathers. And um, so it's mostly the, the, the people with the younger children and later you, you become, uh, yeah, how can I say that? You become a more a normal family, um, which is strange that I say the word normal because I, I'm straight and I co-parent with a gay couple and my children are 14 and 16. Um, so we have the play dates. Um, and what we also see, because the children are smaller, that you're running after your child. So um, uh, it's very difficult to have a conversation of more than one sentence. Um, and what we miss actually is that, for instance, there was an organization for children from about 15 till 22, and they organized their own summer camps for children with, with LGBT parents, but that stopped. And maybe that's interesting to talk about, but I think these kids don't want me to organize a camp. Um, and sometimes there's a child who wants something like that, but it's not often enough. Um, so on one hand, on one side, that's good news. On the other side, yeah, it worked for them, especially uh, for children who had first uh, uh, straight parents and one of them came out of the closet later. So, and we do have something called Pink Saturday and Pride Park. So a few times a year, there's a market in a park and we are there and we invite people to come and tell their story. And then a lot of experienced parents come and tell their story and then we write down their names. And, um, but yeah, that, that, that's our experience, especially the younger children. It was, um, you know, it, it's interesting. And, and what we've seen even here at Men Having Babies is as now that we've been uh, around a while and, um, you know, we we have people that have been through our programs and are now parents um, and those needs and those wishes desire, or change of, of what they're looking for. But, um, and even more so, I think for children, Sarah, you were talking about, you know, different kids want different things. And especially as they get older, a lot of times they say like, I'm so busy in my school and in my other activities, you know, it's not such a key part of, of my identity. Um, but what we really do see is that so many new parents do are seeking out that support. And Ron, I think you have that graphic to share and kind of talk about what we've found in our, in our surveys and um, collecting information about new parents, what they're looking um, for as far as community support and um, programming. Oh, Ron, you're on mute. Still on mute, sorry about that. We have, as many of you know, a survey that's been going on since 2011, I think, uh, already, so before we even incorporated, um, that is, it, it's a parenting survey. It's mostly uh, known for the survey that uh, generates our rating and reviews for surrogacy providers. However, we've been using it extensively for other reasons. First of all, we, we even partnered with the research, research organizations uh, some of them in, in the Netherlands, by the way, that used it for uh, research purposes. Now that we have about 2000 families who already participated, I think um, we've part, we also um, use this uh, questionnaire as the basis for our peer uh, advice network for our parenting. So we will talk about for, for families, we'll talk about that perhaps as well. But one of the things we do is for, the, for needs analysis for, uh, for uh, um, and we've asked people what kind of services they would like once they become parents. And you can see that overwhelmingly the, the large, you know, most people 80% would love to socialize with other um, surrogacy parents in their region as a family with their children. Uh, 
Uh, of course, still, you know, there's uh, a, a desire to have maybe, you know, smaller meetings with uh, surrogacy uh, or gay parents uh, around uh, workshops or opportunities to learn more virtually or in person about issues of common interest, such as how to speak to your children about their origins. Uh, something that we've done uh, at least once or twice already. We've done it in person, we've done it also virtually. Um, now, we added the question about virtual events uh, fairly recently, so it has uh, fewer people who uh, specifically refer to virtual events. But we also, uh, we know that people are um, uh, interested in resources such as books, films, uh, educational programs for their families, and we have a, a book uh, um, a guide as well as research library on our website. And they want to know more about local organizations that can help them, which is what part of what we're doing right now. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm just going to say that, uh, as you can see from the various um, answers here, there are a variety of different types of resources people can uh, benefit from and are interested in. And I have to say that we also need to look at how the situations are very different across, you know, the sun never uh, sets on the MHB uh, uh, network, since we do have people for whom it's right now 1.20 a.m. Uh, out in the Far East. Uh, and uh, we have, of course, a lot of members in Europe and uh, various parts of the United States, Canada, and, and even uh, uh, Latin America. So we have people that live in societies that are in various stages of social acceptance, uh, which is something that's also true within every country. So not only do we have different types of organizations or resources, but we also have different needs. Uh, so um, I think probably, uh, Sarah, you're luckily on the one, side, one end of the spectrum as far as uh, social acceptance and where perhaps it's almost, um, you know, a, a sign of maturity that uh, there might be less need for some services. Uh, but I'm sure, um, you know, many of our members live in areas where that acceptance or at least the, the you know, the uh, depth and the history of that acceptance are not quite as the same. So, uh, Jolly, maybe you, you can speak about a little bit about, uh, have you uh, uh, seen uh, such different needs or different uh, 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 spectrum of uh, needs and, and, um, and a desire for services? Yes. Um, and I, I, I mean, we can speak over the, the course of, you know, going through COVID, but even prior to then, I think it's expanded the needs, filling in the gaps for what's not available. And I know we talk about networking, but it really is, it really is building support for parents. And I think as we see things change in our, you know, in trends in our culture, then you see the needs change for parents. So for example, we um, recently explored the programming that Sarah brought up uh, for young folks to have a soccer program that was hosted by us, getting an intern. Let me take a step back. We have a round table of parents who also kind of help to push the agenda for our family programming. So we have a round table about four to six parents and we have discussions about, well, what are they seeing? What are the needs? Um, what can they contribute also? And one of those parents uh, works at a school. So we often talk about the gaps in schools. And that came to us having this conversation about, well, some folks are, are in need of a place where they can go take their young, their children to soccer and not have to explain, okay, I'm mom, she's mom, this, you know what I mean? Like this, all these, these explanations, they could just go to a place such as Center on Halstead, uh, knowing that our LGBTQ uh, family programming is a welcome space. You can just come as you are, we're gonna affirm uh, and you're gonna build, uh, you're gonna build community. So um, yes, I've seen the trends of things uh, shifting where folks say, you know, I just, want to be able to go and, and have that. A lot of young people already have a lot of that summer programming and being able to have that. And I do know it changes as they get older, Sarah, but um, one of the things that we did talk about was tween programming too, like having something similar to uh, a shut-in, but not really a shut-in overnight, but having you know young teens be able to come, uh, of LGBTQ families being able to come and just kind of hang out and share and share their experiences and check in to see, is there a need for us to create something more for, for uh, 
uh, teens and, and that tween age, uh, because again, where is the education coming from about, where is the, the, the dialogue coming from where they can come and share? Um, so those are some of the things that we've uh, tried to create along with the soccer program we, we talked about. Uh, we already have a story, like a story time, but also giving folks an opportunity to share their stories. Uh, we often encourage our parents to share their stories, but giving young people an opportunity to share their stories and build uh, stories and learn how to advocate. You know, what do you say? How do you approach? So that was something else that we wanted to um, build this last, this this past summer. Uh, it's been a little bit delayed, of course, with everything that's happening. And similar to you, Sarah, a lot of our work for our family programming is, it's the parents themselves or it's volunteers. So finding the support too is, is tough. But yes, I've seen the shift. Um, and I think we need to lean into it, embrace it. And a lot of it isn't, it isn't separating out, it's extending. Does that make sense? Um, you know, our soccer programming, our writer pro writing programming isn't specific, but it's extending the opportunities for uh, young people to be able to learn about gender identity and about families and things like that, something where we see there's a gap for a lot of, for a lot of youth in our community. So, so I, I don't look at it as uh, pulling folks away. And that's the same way we talk about, and I'll stop after this, but our family inclusivity committee um, at Center on Halstead, which is made up of staff. And that's what we often talk about. Our dialogue is often about, it's not about um, shifting or pulling away, but it's extending, it's making the pie larger. I love it. I think, you know, and I think there's some great kind of differences or, or, and um, between these two organizations, but also some, some parallels there. And Sarah, you guys are all volunteers, correct? That's, uh, yeah. And, um, and so where do you get your, like, where's the drive for your program or what you're going to offer? Because I know, especially when you're dealing with, with only volunteers, you do have to be a lot more selective um, just because that bandwidth isn't there to always just add in a new program or, or do something extra. So where does that kind of drive or, or what you guys are going to focus your energy on? Where does that um, originate from? I think we're crazy. <laughs> I spend a lot of time uh, for the foundation uh, instead of doing something for myself. Um, and we have a lot of crazy people, but um, I see it as a, a candy store and there's a lot of candy in the store, but we can just open three tins. And then we open number four. I just opened another one, which takes a lot of time, but we can't open them all uh, because we're not with enough people. So we check what, most people want and we've checked a few years ago about the the group um uh, uh jolie was talking about i hope you have, i pronounce your name properly um and we didn't get any response there was one question from somebody yeah my son is 15 and he wants to communicate with other children of of uh, same-sex parents and nobody responded but the children are not member of our newsletter so the difficult thing when it was a different organization, they had a group, but then when they became older, it just stopped there. So um, I think if there would be a lot of questions, we would organize something. And it's great to organize something for that group because also the intended parents want to know how is it when the child is 18 or 15 or whatever. So, and you want to be there for everybody, but if the question is there and so, but I, I really, I wrote it down uh, Jolie to check it again because maybe things changed and um, it's something to be aware of that we have a gap there. And, and we can uh, maybe help in that, Sarah, because one thing you said, I think is typical is that people, you know, become more involved and then less involved in the organization during different, you know, life cycles or different uh, uh, stages of their parenting even. And they might not be even part of a newsletter anymore when their kids are growing older. Uh, and also there might be not enough of them for maybe an in-person event. Uh, and maybe we can find uh, enough, uh, aggregate that kind of demand uh, in for a virtual event. Uh, but I wanted to first um, highlight something that might not be that obvious for everybody attending this um, webinar right now that, uh, Middle and Center Halstead are 
two uh, very different organizations that uh, different types of organizations that you can find um, and, and then you can find some others. So I just want to first kind of like lay out the, the, the landscape. So we have community centers. Um, really in the United States, uh, there are probably many more than in Europe. Uh, so that is a physical building. It's a service organization. Uh, it is a home for people. Uh, and uh, it is, in the case of uh, Chicago, it's one of the nicest, uh, very beautiful uh, physical plant that you got. But uh, there are in most, uh, if not all major cities in the United States, sometimes even more than one. So that is uh, a physical space. It could help uh, uh, host events, but they typically host events of not just uh, the organization itself, but they are a home for other uh, organizations that can then operate there because that's part of their mission. Uh, but on the other hand, they are not focused on families. And then you have the rainbow family organizations. They tend to be homeless. They don't have a building. Uh, we don't have a building. Um, you have uh, the mostly volunteer operated. Uh, but they're a lot more focused on, on our needs. So I would say they're more typical in Europe than the United States and, and elsewhere, by the way, than the United States. So the United States sometimes because of the fact that you have those large community organizations, you don't necessarily have these volunteer rainbow organizations uh, that you have in Europe. So those are two different uh, models already. And then you have other organizations, like for instance, we really benefited from um, our LGBT synagogue, and there are synagogues and churches and other um, uh, organizations uh, similar to that, probably once again, maybe more in the United States than Europe, that many times are, have the distinction of trying to provide services throughout the entire life cycle, like physical life cycle of people. So you're sometimes more likely to find uh, people who are already have families there. Uh, but then again, I can attest the kids get older, you don't go as often as you used to. Then there are, you know, services, you know, such as I mentioned before, camps or, or uh, vacation organizations and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, services you can, you can use or, or, or uh, tap into that provide some sort of a activity or resource for families. And then you have I would say social networks that are not necessarily LGBT family organizations as such, but if you think of the Pop Lock Club in, in, in the LA, and as I mentioned, this organization that is not as active nowadays uh, in New York, when, uh, but was active when we were more when uh, our kids were younger that organized picnics. Uh, that was not part of the LGBT center. That was not part of any religious or other organization. It was just a social network. It was just a mailing list or a, or some sort of a you know social media sometimes you know and and people just organize spontaneously to get together. Uh, there are very few uh, examples of organizations for the children of LGBT families. In the United States, there's collage uh, that uh, is an, an attempt to create that. Uh, it doesn't have really a lot of local chapters or if any. Uh, but uh, it, you know, it gets um, manifested, for instance, during family week in the summer um, in uh, Provincetown, uh, when, when that occurs in person. Uh, those of you who have older children, so uh, that might be something you want to look into. Um, we also have the teen panels. So it's not, a, it's not an event created for teens to interact with each other, although that happens. It's part of uh, uh, the, you know, if you want the, you know, the, the, the organizations that provide services such as advice. Uh, so the teen panels are a great opportunity for people to uh, learn more about uh, what um, uh, it feels like, uh, you know, to, to raise a child. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention perhaps is the possible inter section, uh, maybe that's part of what you were thinking about, Julie, of services for kids of LGBT parents and services for LGBT kids or teens. 
And I have some examples in my mind, but I also want, I know this is uh, something that perhaps is, is not, um, uh, you know, uh, common, but I think we can, um, we have, we had several instances to think about it, but I've seen it in some countries, in some places, uh, or at least had an opportunity to uh, mention the possible, you know, uh, overlap. But, yeah, but I think that's an interesting direction to think about as well. So any, any thoughts uh, from what I just said regarding the types of services, the type of organizations, uh, and maybe ways we can think of collaborating more between them. And, and so for instance, one, one thought you know, that we have is you know, maybe facilitate, let's say there are, uh, there is a, you know, a, a religious organization in your, in your town uh, that you go to, but they don't have, a teen panel. They don't have a, a lecture about origins, etc. We could envision a situation where you go to your church, you go to your synagogue, you go to your mosque, wherever you go, or non-denominational organization or social organization of, that you are part of and you feel at home with, and you say, how about organizing a certain event? And if you need advice, there's a family there's a rainbow family organization that can perhaps provide the advice. There's a man having babies that can provide the advice. So I think my ideal model is in which uh, we as community members, not necessarily as, as uh, leaders of organizations, lead the, the ask and say, you know, here's a good uh, organization or a good circle or, or a good home to do something. They don't, they're not currently doing what I would love to do, but let me suggest that. I, I can respond, oh, Sarah, go ahead. I thought I saw Lisa wanting to say something earlier and I wanted to give an opportunity if that was okay. Go ahead, Sarah, I'll come after you. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking, what do the children think? Because I know that uh, there was research done and the research says that uh, it's good for children to meet other children from rainbow families to see that what makes their family special, that it's normal. But I also see that children find their own family normal. Um, and what's for the, the age groups, what's, what's so special for them to meet other children? I can imagine that it's different when you're eight than when you're 15. So that maybe that's a question for Jolie, what, what happens in these groups when they're older and what, what needs do they have? I'm very curious. So I want to clarify, we did not execute the teens uh, okay. shut in. We did not, we did not do that. Okay. Um, and that's why I'm still calling it shut in because that was still the initial yes. idea, but that's not what it is. Not okay. yet. Yes. Um, but when our young people um, get together in their families, it's, I mean, there's, there's, it's, I think what it, what happens is not uh, some huge different thing than other kids and groups coming together. It's just being able to see it. And I think see, seeing someone else, seeing another family structure somewhat like yours or maybe a little bit different, or I think that's the, the learning piece. Um, so we haven't done the teens one, but I, and I'm sure what I'm saying to you, Sarah, you've seen in your other family groups, but I think it just gives an opportunity for young people. First of all, it gives the parents an opportunity to network. And I want to come back to that Ron, about, you know, collaboration. But I think it gives the young people an opportunity to talk with others who may know what they're speaking about or what they're talking about when they say this versus having to explain or having to feel awkward. So I think it just gives an opportunity for um, exposure and experience. And I think those are the best learning, right? But, but is it, do they want like to play soccer together with people? Oh, you have two, two, two fathers and let's play soccer. Or is it more that they really want to talk about hmm, two dads or two dads and a, and, and, and a mother in another house or whatever? Do they talk about not... their family construction or is it just it's nice to be in an environment where I'm not the only one with two fathers? We have not led that with our young folks. So there's two things that we have. We also have um, uh, a, uh, a youth 
I'm sorry, I'm saying a youth, but it's basically like a kid's area for kids to just come and hang out. And so you'll see all sorts of like strollers and nannies and things like that, um, more so pre-pandemic. Um, so we have that at that age. And then we also have our events, like what I was trying to pull up before the family, you know, the picnics and things like that. So at these though, I we're not leading a conversation with our young people about your family. We're just allowing, for space to hang out and have a good time. Right. The same thing with the soccer event, same thing with the writing event. It's not a writing specifically on family. It's just creative writing so you can tell your own story. I think it's good though for if there's something there, then you feel in a safe space. You, you feel in a safer space because you know you're surrounded by other folks who may understand your experience. Right. So they're not, none of those events are focused on leading a conversation around that. Okay. When our kids um, were very young, as I mentioned, uh, it was those times when we uh, either get get together, quite frankly, with one more couple, uh, sometimes just one more couple that had uh, a similar family structure, uh, as well as they would be in a place where they saw similar families. It just had the effect of normalizing. Uh, so that that um, was not, of course, on a deep level of education, but just an understanding that, uh, you know, they're not the only ones in the world that have this family. And the fact, part of the reason that they grew up to think that everybody's different and they're not any different than other people is because we created, we, we, we labored a little bit uh, to create those, um, uh, you know, uh, those settings, because otherwise they were the only kids um, to an LGBT couple in their school. Uh, almost all of the years that they were there, there were some years that there was another kid some in some other grade or another two kids in the other grades, but in their grade, they were always the only kids that had, uh, and this is New York, of course, not Manhattan, but still. So having said that, it's also, you know, we're talking about many years ago, I presume there are more kids, a little more kids uh, nowadays. And and we're working to make that case, to make it so. But uh, so that's the normalizing. But when they were, I would say, really older than eight, and we took them uh, to this uh, family camp, uh, so that parents and kids together, and they started socializing with kids um, in in a more in a deeper way. Then all of a sudden, they found another, you know, other kids through surrogacy, and they were talking about their donors and about this, about that, and it was very interesting. They would come back and report about, you know. What, what did uh, Charlie say about this? What did Emma say about that? And I think that was very interesting for them uh, in, in, that, in that regard. Uh, and then we took them to pride events. Uh, we took them to, uh, you know, to a march or to a party, uh, pride and, and pride became, you know, one of our major holidays of the year. And this is where I say that to some extent when we had uh, a session about that, to what extent they become part of the community, even if they're identified eventually as straight, uh, they're part of the community. So, um, so I would say that at very different um, settings, they're very different, you know, ways of socializing and 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 formats and 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 you know, and compositions uh, achieve different uh, 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 goals. And I would say I would I would end with just saying that when they went to their camp on their own, camp highlight. Uh, not a family camp, but the camp, a uh, sleepaway camp. Um, that was also a very interesting thing as well, because there, there was, um, everybody was kids of LGBT parents, but they came from very, very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when they went to uh, their school, they were all, you know, middle class, high middle class uh, parents. Uh, when they went there, they had pe people from a, a spectrum of, you know, of, uh, socioeconomic and racial backgrounds and family structure background, but they developed a sense of ownership when there were issues happening at camp or when a kid was disruptive, etc. It was their camp and their community, and they felt that they um, they didn't see that person as as, uh, as as somebody who's interrupting, you know, the session, but like, like almost like a brother or sister that needs to be accommodated. So there was a interesting, we saw in them all of a sudden an interesting uh, shift uh, of being, you know, reluctant uh, members of this, you know, uh, category to feeling ownership and feeling that this is their group and they need to make it be better. They need to make sure that whoever, 
doesn't feel good and that group feels better because we're all the same. We're all, mm -hmm. we have this common, uh, common denominator. So, so I think there are rooms for a lot of different models and they serve different purposes. Absolutely. I think, you know, and especially as new parents, you know, play groups are, are wonderful, um, but they really are more of a support for parents than a, than a, a support for the kids. It's an opportunity for, for you as a new parent or a, um, somebody with toddlers or, or preschool age children, especially when parenting can seem so overwhelming um, to have a, a space where you can talk with people in similar circumstances or share experiences in, in a way um, that's there for you and supportive and, and hopefully while your kids are occupied um, and, and having fun for a moment. So you can have that time to, to build your community and build that support system because it can change um, very much so after your children are born. You can go from, you know, kind of your identity as, as a, a couple or a single person, but shifting into that identity as a parent can be a, a difficult transition and your needs and your community changes in that. And so having that resource available um, for you to help grow that for your own self. And then as your children grow in, in developmentally, as they kind of break away, right? As children develop into their own wonderful person, um, they start to shift away from the family as they build their identity and then still maintaining those programs um, or that sense of community for your child or whatever those needs may be. And for some children, it's absolutely not uh, in this trajectory or sometimes it is. Um, but before kind of we close out here, um, I know we're gonna have people saying, this is great, but I don't live in Chicago. I don't live in the Netherlands. I live somewhere where this program's not available. Um, so I didn't, I wanted to kind of end with um, Julie and Sarah, if you have any advice for, for parents to be or, or new parents um, that might be living in a community that doesn't have something central to them, um, how can they best advocate or start or, or find um, supports out there? Sarah, do you want to start? Yeah, there's a there's a, a Facebook group in the Netherlands with all pink parents, and it's not our group. We decided not to host a group like that because that also takes a lot of time. And there's a group hosted by somebody else, and you see requests from people who want a play date in whatever Rotterdam, and then people meet each other through these Facebook groups, and so then it's not officially organized, but you can find your way in meeting other people and people find that very useful. So it happens also without us interfering. That's great. It, it is nice. And I, in Julie even uh, alluded to it earlier that with the pandemic, um, you know, resources have been able to, to be focused on virtual, which is more inclusive uh, and a wider geographic range. Um, so Julie, do you have any advice for anybody listening about forming their own community or, or finding that support? Um, you led right into, Lisa, what I was going to say uh, to Ron's point. Um, the center on Austin, yes, is a center, but we really try to partner, just like Sarah was mentioning when it's limited resources, we try to partner with a lot of the community groups. Uh, for example, we had a community group of, um, uh, of, of men, it was initially called uh, Cinema Gays, and then we talked about, well, you know, expanding. I mean, who is it for? You're talking about family issues. You're talking about, um, so it's now Rainbow Cinema, and you know, there, you know, parents who can come together, LGBTQ folks come together and, and watch different movies and share. So it's about creating community, however you like, um, and supporting that. So we, as a center, want to support that. And I think one of the things, um, as we talk about exposure and experience and education and and building. Um, empathy. I think about uh, Hope Lab came out with something about uh, resilience during this time. And the three things that they talked about were uh, making sure you have a purpose and a meaning, uh, authentic connection and a sense of control. And I wonder if we can help for those who are listening, and maybe we can talk more about how we do this as a follow-up, but how do we give that, especially in this kind of virtual space, give more of that of a framework to parents, because you may not come to Chicago or, or meet with Sarah's group, but the, you likely have something to offer. You likely have something purposeful that you can offer and connecting that with other folks and, um, and, and you know, allowing a sense of, of control during this time. I think that's really great for some parents to build groups. So for Ron, as you, as you talked about the church, I was thinking, uh, I was thinking of discipleship. 
That's what it's got to come down to. It's got to come down to how do we give the tools to other folks that can go out and do it also. So some of the parents that may be listening, you may not have uh, a center or uh, another location, a rainbow location right next to you, but you may know someone else who would benefit from your wisdom, from your experiences. And the best way to learn is to share, right? Is to teach and to share it with one another. So that shared learning opportunities, I think is great. So what I would say uh, to wrap it up, Lisa, to your question, I would say, if you don't have a source, reach out, see what we can offer you and you can start it right there. And it doesn't have to be a big commitment. It could be something simple that you do that allows for sheer stories. Yeah, can I, can I add something? Uh, we saw the, the most participants when we organized it in a very nice place that you go there with the children and there is a play garden or whatever, but something really special. Um, so a lot of families, thought that that's a nice thing to do that Sunday, uh, even if it's um, just with our own family or with other rainbow families. So then we really had a lot of people joining uh, because we did something really special. And if it's a picnic in the park, then it's more local, then it's more the people from that city. That, that's what our experience is when it's not raining. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think I, I hope everybody feels really empowered that if there's something that that you feel would add to your um, support system or your experience or your children's experience um, to that you have that ability to make it happen. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, on the on the scale of, of organizations that are already existing, but they've all started somewhere um, and you absolutely have that ability to to grow. And and there are tools out there to help you. You don't have to. Um, reinvent the wheel or, or start completely from scratch. Um, and in fact, I think Ron's going to share um, some of what we have available in really making those connections and maybe finding somebody else in your area interested in, in doing those things um, as well through our parent and peer network. Um, Ron, if you want to. Yeah, sure. And, and um, I'll show you uh, some of the resources we have. So first of all, I'm, I'm showing you right now the family zone page it's under get involved. Uh, so if you are indeed a family by now and you haven't seen this page, I highly recommend it. Uh, at the bottom here are links to a lot of the organizations uh, that are supportive uh, and collaborating, uh, collaborating with MHB, uh, including organizations that are mentioned uh, that are participating today. So uh, by all means, you know, use that as a resource. There, you know, you can click on their uh, uh, on their uh, profiles and and find out how to get hold of them. Um, I mentioned the book guide and the research library. They are linked from here. You can take a look at them. We have member, we have a member or other family program uh, that you can always, um, uh, you know, check out to see uh, what's coming up. Some of them are, of course, uh, still virtual, as as you said, not necessarily because of the pandemic, but because of the aggregation. They provide uh, opportunity. They provide to have people that otherwise are too dispersed to have uh, their own uh, in-person event. And then I think really the best thing is that we have this peer advice and peer uh, support uh, parent network. So if you go there, it's uh, you know elsewhere on our website, but it's linked from the Family Zone. You can see dozens and dozens of uh, families from across the world, really. Um, that have agreed to meet you if you're a prospective parent, but also meet you as if you're another a family. So you can find a group of people here to have a picnic together uh, if they're roughly from your region. Uh, you can uh, find people that have a particular age uh, of children. You can search through a lot of different criteria through uh, residents, uh, through, of course, uh, you know, languages, uh, whether they're single or, or, or a couple, a couple. I mean, if you're a single parent somewhere, that might be a very good resource for you to uh, share or reach out. And whether they have, you know, children of uh, that were born through a, with the help of a family member, or you know, they experienced uh, various uh, types of um, even setbacks or other events during this. And beyond this, we have a. We have a list. We have, you know, we have thousands of uh, uh, parents and families uh, in our list. So even if they're not here, and you live in a, you live somewhere in Texas, and you wonder whether there's an opportunity, perhaps, to organize something um, 
uh, local, uh, and you don't see our organization on our website, you know, reach out to us. Uh, and we can A, see maybe there's an organization that's not necessarily featured here that we are aware of that we can re, uh, refer you to, but we can even mention it in our newsletter to that uh, segment of the population, or uh, um, maybe even create a you know, particular uh, uh, emailing uh, to talk about uh, an initiative or to let uh, uh, that initiative uh, be known to people. So we're really working on becoming more community oriented and help aggregate those needs as we know they exist. Uh, so, uh, so really, uh, I'll, I'll let you, uh, Lisa, wrap up, but I would say uh, there is an opportunity here for a lot of interesting connections. As I mentioned, sometimes maybe in the connection as I've seen it in Israel, for instance, between or an organization that is geared towards kids that are LGBT to uh, kids who are kids of LGBT people. Of course, some of them are both. And uh, so there are all kinds of interesting connections that could be made uh, and let's use the resources and the technology we have uh, to try to make them. Thank you. And thank you so much to Julie and Sarah for joining us today um, and sharing their expertise, their experience and the resources available um, through their centers and, and organizations and hopefully um, to give you guys an idea of what's out there. Um, the support out there. We really want to make sure everyone feels empowered to find their community of support. Um, and I know we, while we are called men having babies, we also um, love men who have had babies um, and are more than willing to help you find uh, your community of support. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us team at menhavingbabies.org. Um, we certainly also hope to see you at upcoming events. Most notably, we'll be at the Center on Halstead October 9th. Um, for our next really soon. Uh, very soon um, we'll be there um, followed by Brussels our European conference um, coming up in November so we absolutely love to see you in person um, but we love to see you virtually as well and we have a lot of upcoming events um, we hope that you'll join membership um, and take advantage of those resources as well um, but anytime if you have questions whether it's about becoming a parent or after you've already become a parent um, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Men Having Babies um, and hopefully we'll see you guys um, at our next event. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.